a prototype aircraft takes to the air for the first time. This is the YA-7F, a response to a 1985 United States Air Force specification for a new close air support and interdiction aircraft. This is not a new plane. The airframe of this aircraft had first flown nearly 20 years before. The new prototype A7F was the latest in a series of models developed from one of aviation's great successes, the Vought Corsair II, a plane that had first seen action on the 2nd of December, 1967, over Vietnam. They have an enduring reputation for accuracy in their strikes, but they also have their idiosyncrasies. In a supersonic age, they are subsonic, and certainly anything but pretty. Perhaps beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and their pilots did love them for their looks, but they loved them more for their ruggedness, dependability, and accuracy. When the first A7s were used in Vietnam, they provided the Navy's carriers with an immediate boost in striking power. And they remain the big ship's standard light attack weapon far longer than could have been predicted. The Corsair II's first Vietnam missions introduced a new generation of navigation and attack avionics to the battlefield. Though these aids have been superseded, the airframe's soundness has been recognized and rewarded by technical updates ever since, and is still in service. Eight hundred and fifty-four of the 1,500 A7s built took part in the Vietnam conflict. They flew over 97,000 sorties in the Southeast Asian theater. Those missions were designed to deliver precise results. Where a B-52 would pulverize broad acreage, the A7 would come in low to attack a specific target. The Navy flew them in Vietnam with 27 squadrons. 54 A7s were lost to enemy fire in those 97,000 Navy missions. The losses were higher with earlier models because as weapons accuracy increased, so did the number of single pass attacks. Still, the nature of the missions at valuable, well-defended targets made them highly dangerous. Relatively slow, low-level attacks invited retaliation. The North Vietnamese retaliated vigorously. So the losses were not excessive, and the returns in terms of strike accuracy were very impressive. Back in the 40s and 50s, with 
the introduction of jet engines, and the results of research carried out during World War II, rapid advances were made in aviation design. Increasingly powerful engines were combined with sophisticated airframes, and a new aspect of performance, called avionics, changed the way planes were used. So the service life of a combat aircraft was relatively short, because by the time it had been deployed, a fighter or attack aircraft was well on its way to being outdated. The opening of hostilities in Vietnam found the Navy's attack planes in a period of transition. The type in service was the Douglas A-4 Skyhawk. This was a single-seat attack plane that had first been presented to the Navy in 1952. It had gone into service in 1956. It was the smallest and lightest jet adopted by the Navy and was relatively simple and inexpensive to build and maintain. It performed accurately, but load and range limitations meant a limited service life. Douglas had done a fine job with the Skyhawk filling a gap that had opened up when the Navy introduced heavier attack aircraft to handle nuclear weapons. Earlier attack types had been supplemented by fighter bombers, but when the limitations of jet technology forced fighters into more specialized shapes, they were unable to carry much additional load. This created a need for a light attack aircraft. In Korea, that role was taken by the Chancevoort Corsair I, the bent-winged F-4U one of the World War's outstanding fighter designs. It had stayed in production and service after 1945, and in Korea was a versatile and potent workhorse. But it did not have the load capability of other types, and was no longer competitive as a fighter. It passed into well-deserved retirement to be remembered as one of the finest planes of its era. The Corsair's inverted gull wing symbolized an attitude of the Vought Company, a willingness to adopt unconventional designs where they served a worthwhile purpose. But their first jet, the Pirate, was fairly conventional. The Pirate was ordered in 1944 and first flown in 1946, but was not particularly effective, and few were built. Vought's next Navy design, the F-7U Cutlass, was far more radical and far more successful. It re-established the company's good reputation with the Navy. In a period of innovation and experimentation, this was the most advanced and adventurous design to go into production. With two engines, no tail, and twin rudders set midway out on the wings, it was a single-seat fighter unlike anything in service. The wing was stubby and swept back at 38 degrees, and the plane resembles today's F-14 more than it did its contemporaries. The design of the Cutlass had started in 1945, and prototypes flew in 1948. Like many planes of its time, it was ordered in small numbers and did not stay in service long. It suffered high attrition from accidents and engine failures. The elongated nose strut, which allowed a higher angle of attack during landing, also limited pilot visibility. The design, though a success, had other disadvantages that cut development short. By the time Vought's next Navy fighter went into carrier service in 1955, it had passed Mach 1 on its first flight. This was the F-8U Crusader, which was to be the Navy's first thousand-mile-an-hour plane in service. Its story began with a Navy request in September 1952 for supersonic day fighter designs. The Vought proposal won the contract in May 1953, and the experimental plane took off for the first time on March the 25th, 1955. At first glance, this is a far more straightforward aircraft than the Cutlass, but in fact, it was highly innovative. It was the first aircraft designed from the ground up to use the new design concept called Area Rule 
perfect for minimum drag at and above the speed of sound and its superb wing design introduced many refinements still standard on today's fighter aircraft. Today, the Crusader has an unassailable reputation. It had outstanding maneuverability, performance, and a powerful attack. In addition, it proved to have immense development potential. Back in 1955, Two prototypes embarked on a test series so successful that by December that year, only nine months after the first flight, they were ordered into quantity production. There was no need for the third prototype, and the Navy orders were placed well before completion of the testing. Half the fuselage was occupied by the giant engine, fed by the chin inlet, and a large duct running down the center of the plane. The cockpit was perched right at the aircraft's nose, and despite the low drag canopy, the pilot had very good all-round vision. The wing was the center of outstanding innovation. The whole wing was pivoted, hinged at the rear to allow a variable angle of incidence. This was a response to the need of carriers and allowed slower landing and takeoff speeds without harming high-speed performance. Where the Cutlass had sacrificed pilot vision with its nose-up attitude, the Crusader's hinged wings supplied good low-speed performance with a level fuselage. The pilot's view was clear, and the plane handled superbly, the best of both worlds. The variable wing had to be mounted on top of the fuselage, unusual in a fighter, but the level approach meant the plane could have shorter than normal landing gear, which retracted into the fuselage. Soon, a number of variants were being developed, including the 2N Night Fighter and the 2NE Multi-Role Fighter Bomber. The basic airframe was to appear in 18 production versions. In 1958, the F-8U-2 was introduced an upgraded and refined Crusader. From this, in 1960, came the development of the 2N, a night fighter version, still making use of the standard Crusader features, like the air brake and retracting refueling point. The Crusader already had its unguided rockets augmented with rails for the Sidewinder missile, but the 2N also had new powerful radar to provide target illumination for its own special version of the Sidewinder. The F-8 had been designed from the start for weapons versatility, and it was to serve as a launching platform for the majority of United States airborne weapons. Its high wing made stores mounting easy, just one of the factors that helped the Crusader do its job well. The design was so sound that it stayed in production from 1956 to 1965. And from 1960 to the late 1970s, the plane went through major rebuilding and updating programs. Almost all the surviving F-8s were rebuilt. At the same time, their contemporaries were simply junked as obsolete and no longer capable of frontline service. At the heart of the Crusader's success was the still very modern profile wing, a masterpiece of aerodynamic and structural design. In 1952, supersonic flight was still a realm of mystery and guesswork, but the Vought team managed to engineer a design of great understanding and clear vision. According to the pattern of the times, the Crusader should have had a short service life, 
but when specifications were issued for another breed of Navy fighter in 1955, Vought took the opportunity to rework the design again, this time as an all-weather interceptor, the Crusader III. If this competition could be won, the company would have an assurance of continued work. At the heart of the new version was the J-75 engine, a monster that pushed up the top speed of the Crusader by over 500 miles an hour to Mach 2.3. It also had a larger radar and provision for three big Sparrow missiles. But the most striking external change was the addition of hinged ventral fins to enhance maneuverability. Despite the era's theories of missile dominance, the Crusader kept its guns with their close-in fighting ability. This was not the case with the plane that beat it in the competition fly-offs in 1958, McDonald's superb F-4 Phantom. The Phantoms would, ironically, later have guns added, but at that stage, complete reliance on sophisticated missiles was a factor in their victory. The Crusader III was a design success, and in many ways was equal to or better than the Phantom, but it was out of fashion. Its strengths did not satisfy the needs of the market. The Navy wanted a plane with two crew members and two engines. The Phantom was about to make its own mark in history. Five Crusader III's were built, only three flew, and the orders were canceled. For Vought, the rebuff was not only a disappointment, but a threat to the company's existence. It was now possible that production work scheduled to December 1964 would be finished without any new orders to occupy the plant. The next Navy role to be filled was the replacement of the carrier's light attack plane. The excellent Skyhawk had entered service in 1956. By 1960, the Navy was looking for a replacement. In Vietnam, the light and nimble little Douglas planes were later to provide valuable service, and the Marines would order updated versions to replace their much-loved Skyhawks. But the carriers had different needs from the Marines. New Navy specifications were issued in 1963. The requirements for range and load were roughly double those of the Skyhawk. The Navy also set very tight production targets. Reliability and maintenance schedules were specified. To help speed delivery and save money, it was made clear that all proposals should be based on existing aircraft. This also meant the Navy could make its selection with confidence in the technology and performance of the plane and its ability to fill the naval attack role. The Navy specifications were content with one aspect of the Skyhawk's performance, its speed. Studies had shown that a demand for supersonic capability would result in a heavier and more expensive plane without a matching increase in effectiveness. So no maximum speed was prescribed, and economy of construction and operation was stressed. The Skyhawk's replacement would be subsonic. The light attack requirement was issued on the 17th of May, 1963, and the Vought engineers set to work on the company's submission. At the head of the team was Russell Clark, one of the handful of distinguished American designers to have profoundly influenced the development of U.S. combat aircraft. He had been responsible for the Crusader's design. 
the Crusader began as the basis for the new Vought proposal, which was declared competition winner on the 11th of February, 1964. However, by the time the design was accepted, Vought had strayed from the criteria. The plane was a new design. Certainly it bore a strong family resemblance to the F-8, but there were almost no shared parts or equipment. The A-7 only retained some of the F-8's design features, like the low turbulence chin intake. Overall, it was a new aircraft. Gone was the hinged variable incidence wing in favor of a steeper deck attitude and larger flaps. The wing was set high on the fuselage with ample clearance for a heavy stores load. It was moderately swept and tapered, giving delayed drag and better maneuverability. The original A7s were equipped with multi-mode radar and a comprehensive navigation and attack system. This advanced electronics capability was installed in an airframe precisely modeled to the plane's mission. There were six stores pylons slung under the wings, carefully positioned to keep them in line with the center of gravity. The plane had a huge speed brake to help maneuvering during low-level attack missions. The power plant of the new aircraft was manufactured by Pratt & Whitney, an 11,000-pound thrust turbofan engine. This would give the plane a top speed of 578 miles an hour at sea level. Further company studies had confirmed that strike aircraft would gain little benefit from supersonic speed, except, of course, when trying to outrun fighters. There were only 42 steps involved in engine installation, and a four-man team of mechanics could remove an engine in around a quarter of an hour. Over time, the engine was assessed as marginally underpowered for the plane, and later A7s were fitted with a sequence of progressively more powerful engines. The new planes were extremely impressive, with an unprecedented weapons-carrying capability. They had retained two of the Crusader's four cannon, and in addition, the A-7 could be loaded with a wide range of stores, up to a weight of 20,000 pounds. Other changes from the F-8 included a widened fuselage, accommodating a generous fuel load, an uplifted rear end to allow more deck clearance, and the Corsair's sophisticated navigation and aiming computers. The plane completed its first flight ahead of schedule on the 27th of September, 1965, and flew 35 times in the next 33 days. It was publicly presented at a demonstration flight on the 2nd of November. Two A7A aircraft were flown that day, one with a relatively modest but impressive bomb load, and the other with clean wings. The plane that was to become the new benchmark in naval attack aircraft was about to make the first step in establishing its legendary reputation. The appreciative crowd was treated to simulated attack passes at high speed and dive bombing runs. The United States was by then embroiled in the Vietnam conflict, and here was a plane well suited to service in that theater. The Navy's contract had been very strict. Its targets and deadlines were backed by a range of penalty clauses. The Vought team was able to meet all but one of the requirements. The only exception was that the A7A, with its wings strengthened for carrier operation, came in at 600 pounds over the designed weight. But with the plane performing beyond expectation, the Navy was happy to announce a contract for a further 140 production aircraft. As testing continued, 
the Navy became more and more involved with its new aircraft. Naval personnel began familiarization and training. Senior mechanics and armorers worked with company staff to refine servicing and maintenance techniques for the planes. As production swung into full gear, the first Navy pilots also became involved with the A-7. Experienced Navy test pilots were first up. They began flying their own test series in parallel to the company's pilots. The Navy announced to the world its total satisfaction with the course of the plane's development. The A-7 seemed to be just what they were looking for. Despite several aircraft losses during testing, there had been no fatalities. None of the crashes gave evidence of design flaws. And so, the A-7 went into service. Initial carrier trials showed up the first major problems with the design. During launch, steam from the catapult was sucked into the intake, reducing the already low power. This could lead to a compressor stall, and while a permanent solution was being found, the Navy imposed a reduction of 3,000 pounds in takeoff weight. The steam ingestion problem was to tarnish the A7's reputation until the introduction of the B model with a more powerful engine. In spite of the problem with the engine's power, the Corsair was needed in Vietnam. Deployment of the planes into active service proceeded through 1967, with squadrons training on aircraft. On the 4th of December, pilots flying from the USS Ranger took the Corsair on its first combat strikes. The Corsairs from Ranger were soon being used in a variety of missions, not only interdiction against the bridges and roads of the Vietnamese transport system, but also against missile sites. On another type of mission, armed reconnaissance patrols, small numbers of aircraft spent hours taking advantage of the A-7's range searching the Vietnamese roads for targets of opportunity. The raids were not to be without cost. The first A-7 lost was one of the original squadron aboard Ranger. It was hit by ground fire on the 22nd of December, 1967, 18 days after the first combat mission. The squadron aboard Ranger, VA-147, was to fly the Corsairs for almost two decades. They would be replaced by F-A-18s in 1985. On the first Vietnam deployment, under the leadership of Commander James Hill, the Ranger squadron tested the plane's war-making potential extensively. Their results confirmed what the Navy had been asserting for two years. Here was the world's finest light attack aircraft. And enthusiasm for the A-7 was not misplaced. The Navy's confidence was to be rewarded time and again by their rugged and dependable performance. The men of VA-147 were to have a long and eventful cruise, including a side trip to the waters off North Korea. The USS Pueblo, an intelligence ship, had been seized by the North Koreans. It would be the end of May 1968 before Ranger was relieved by the USS America. During most of that time, Ranger had operated off the North Vietnamese coast. Her pilots flew their deadly missions from the Gulf of Tonkin against an increasingly well-organized air defense.
The A7, with its hitting power, fitted neatly into the aircraft complement aboard the carriers. The aircraft alongside them each had their own strengths, and the big ships often launched coordinated assaults using a variety of planes. These mass raids were called Alpha Strikes, and typically might consist of F-4 Phantoms, A-6 Intruders, A-4 Skyhawks, and the Corsairs. Together with supporting electronic countermeasures, tanker and reconnaissance aircraft, a raid might consist of 50 planes, each with its own part to play. A variety of weaponry could be selected to make up a package for a sortie. For missions against the surface to where missile sites, Shrike missiles would be used. Whereas for an attack on a bridge, 500 pound bombs were loaded. Standard in case of MIG attacks were the sidewinders. The variety of ordnance used with the A-7s and the precision with which it could be delivered emphasized the success of the Vought team. They had attained their goals. The reputation of the A-7 as a preeminent attack aircraft was now secure. The carrier's mix of aircraft included some outstanding types. Among these were the Grumman Intruders, the all-weather medium attack planes that replaced the venerable A-1 Sky Raiders. Specialized attack versions of the Intruder were developed. They were also used as ECM and tanker aircraft. The A-7 shared the decks with the planes that had terminated the Crusader's production, the F-4 Phantom. There were reconnaissance variants of the Phantom, but its primary role was that of fighting, with the Marines and the Air Force, as well as the carriers. One of the most striking looking planes on the carrier deck was the North American RA-5C Vigilante, a two-seater reconnaissance aircraft. Vigilantes provided tactical intelligence with their infrared line scan, side-looking radar, and battery of cameras. Capable of Mach 2, they provided their services throughout the Vietnam conflict. The Crusaders had stayed in service due to their better ability to operate from small carriers. They deployed their four cannon and missiles to good effect in the skies of Vietnam. So valuable were they on the smaller ships that the Crusaders used by the Marines were withdrawn from land bases and refitted for shipboard deployment. This potent mixture of aircraft made the carriers major players in the air war over Indochina. They could assert local air superiority over any target in North Vietnam and deliver devastating strikes. Their power from close offshore was such an immediate threat to the North that they could almost totally restrict the activities of Vietnamese aircraft over their own country. The carriers contained a complete air fighting force. They could locate targets and assess damage with their recon flights and then strike with devastating power, clearing defenses as they went. Though the pilots were kept busy dodging anti-aircraft artillery and surface-to-air missiles, much of the North Vietnamese firepower was electronically suppressed or showered with anti-radiation shrikes. The targets identified in surveillance were dealt heavy and swift punishment.
On the big ships, there was almost constant activity and bustle. The deck of a carrier is a noisy place, and at sea near Vietnam, there were very few days off. The attacks during rolling thunder went on without pause and thoroughly tested the big ships as single weapon systems. They passed that test with flying colors. Proving themselves in the midst of this frantic activity were the A-7 Corsairs. They had completely won over their pilots. Initially, they were seen as just another F-8, and they were nicknamed Sluts. S for short, L for little, U for ugly. But although the name stuck, it became a term of endearment rather than a score. The Corsairs multiplied rapidly, and by 1972, they had replaced most of the A-4s as the Navy's light attack weapon. Their virtues were noticed in other quarters as well, with the Air Force giving the design an intense scrutiny as the candidate for the role of tactical fighter. They had ordered test planes only three months after the first flight. Designated the A-7D, the Air Force variant went into service evaluation in April of 1968. The A-7Ds were the first Air Force subsonic fighters in 15 years. They replaced supersonic types, which had proved to have inadequate load carrying and loiter capability for the job in Vietnam. Only 72 of these Air Force variants were deployed to the war, where they performed well, not only in their attack role, but in flying search and rescue missions. In the course of one of these missions, an A-7 stayed airborne for almost nine hours achieved by aerial refueling and amazing pilot stamina. In spite of their limited war exposure, the Air Force planes were of major significance in the story of the Vought Corsair. The U.S. Air Force had not been content simply to buy a Navy plane. They had stipulated several upgrades and changes. These changes made an already excellent aircraft into something even better. Navy orders for the early variants had totaled 462, 199 A models, 196 Bs, and 67 Cs. These, with the 459 ordered for the Air Force, represented a major production run. But the Navy was very impressed by the changes made on the Ds and ordered a similar plane, the A-7E. Eventually, 535 of these were also built. The principal modifications in the new versions were a change of engines and a boost to the sophistication of the plane's equipment. The already remarkable accuracy of these planes now became truly phenomenal. The aircraft were very stable in flight, making them an excellent launching platform. With their new nav attack system, they excelled. This increased accuracy is believed to account for the far lighter losses in Vietnam operations with later models. They simply spent less time where it was dangerous because the job was done more quickly. In another change, the two cannon were replaced by a single Gatling gun firing 20 millimeter ammunition. For the first time, the pilot could select a rate of fire 4,000 rounds a minute, up to 6,000. The E models were to fly almost as many Vietnam missions as all other models combined, as the A-7s carved themselves a major part in the history of the Southeast Asian Air War. With a mission average of two and a quarter hours, 90,000 sorties means that the Corsairs spent well over 8,400 complete days aloft in the combat zone. When the nature of their missions is borne in mind, their loss ratio not only makes sense, but it is surprisingly low. The final Navy Corsair combat operations 
during the linebacker raids from May 1972 to January 1973 involved mostly the later models. The campaign was an all-out effort to subdue the North Vietnamese tactical exploitation of the Paris peace talks and included some of the fiercest raids of the war. The Corsairs flew a lot of the most dangerous missions against bridges and missile launch and storage sites. These sites were marked by powerful aircraft defenses, SAMs, AAA, and ground fire, rising in a ragged but extremely dangerous curtain to meet the attackers. The A-7s had a long war. The E-models flew some of the last missions in the spring of 1975 when they supported the Mayaguez rescue and the Eagle Pool and frequent wind evacuations of Phnom Penh and Saigon. Two years before, an A-7D flying some 40 miles north of Phnom Penh had dropped the last American-delivered ordinance of the conflict. This event occurred around noon on the 15th of August, 1973. Navy combat operations had ceased that January with the end of missions over Vietnam. The Corsairs have seen action several times since Vietnam days over Libya, Lebanon, Grenada, and the Persian Gulf. Each time they proved their worth and the value of their continued upgrading. But it was in the Southeast Asian skies that they really made their reputation. They are not the most glamorous aircraft, but then again, glamour was not one of the specifications. They represent a fine and enduring approach to a particular type of work. They can only reasonably be assessed in the light of that job. There is no doubt at all about the excellence of their record. Hopes of further major sales overseas were not realized. The plane was twice selected by air forces, Canadian and Swiss, only to have politicians overturn the choice in favor of the cheaper and more basic Northrop F-5. In the end, only two foreign air forces equipped themselves with Corsairs. The Greeks bought 60 new aircraft, and the Portuguese bought 50 that had been refurbished. The Greek planes, designated A7H, are essentially A7Es built without carrier gear. The last of these was delivered to Athens in 1977. Greece also purchased six twin-seat trainers, two serving with each of the three Corsair squadrons. The trainers were delivered in 1980. Since delivery of the Greek planes, Vought's production has been limited. They have worked as subcontractors, producing assemblies for Boeing and McDonnell Douglas, among others, and undertaken some systems installation and assembly work. Together with other companies, they have also teamed to develop helicopter designs. Unlike the specially constructed Greek planes, the Portuguese aircraft, designated A7P, were refurbished ex-US Navy A7As. They had a more powerful engine and A7E standard navigation and weapons delivery systems. The last of these modernized A7s was delivered to Portugal in 1984. The Corsair has, despite its age, refused to die. On the 7th of May, 1987, a U.S. Air Force contract was issued to upgrade two A-7Ds to a new standard for testing. These Corsairs had already received several updates during their careers, including a sophisticated low-altitude night attack system. The outstanding thing about the new specification 
was that as part of an extensive rebuilding, the planes were to emerge as supersonic for the first time. The Air Force is seeking an improvement in its air-to-ground support capability, and the list of modifications specified is long and impressive. It is yet another tribute to the fine airframe that the Corsair II is still regarded as worthy of major modification. If the trials are successful, it is expected that over 300 of the now venerable planes will be rebuilt to fly on into the next century.